Thank you guys so much. Alrighty. It's good to be here. Um, I, I'm blessed with the opportunity to be able to speak for you guys tonight and give you guys my testimony and tell you what God has done in my life, what he's done for me and what he brought me out of. For those of you who saw the flyer for tonight, you, see, you saw former Satanist testimony. So I'll get into that in a little bit, but I'm going to give you guys a little bit of my background from my childhood to set up the snowball effect that happened throughout my entire life. So my childhood was rather interesting. Um, there was a lot of things that happened that made me question a lot of things. Um, my mom brought me up in the church, and she did so alone. We lived with my grandmother for the majority of my childhood, and um, my grandmother was rather abusive towards both of us, and that that's what set the snowball in motion for where I am now. Um, God 100% used everything that happened to me throughout my entire life to bring me where I am now so that I can reach people who went through what I did. Um, and I give God 100% glory even, even through that storm, even through the storm that was my childhood, through the storm that was being abused both physically and otherwise. And I say that to say that no matter what you're going through, God can bring you out of that. All we've got to do is reach out. And he's ready to reach down and pluck us up out of that miry pit that we're in, no matter what it may be. So as I got older, getting back on track a little bit now, as I got older and as I was going through my school years, um, I, I started experiencing a lot of bullying, as is very common today. Um, I was never a small guy, except for whenever I was about three. Um, so, <laughs> so naturally, uh, a lot of people decided they were going to pick on me for my size. Um, that started from kindergarten all the way up until whenever I was in high school. And I want, I want everyone to know that if you're going through bullying, just trust God. Because no matter how bad it gets, and trust me, for me, it got really bad. There was days whenever I was shoved into lockers. I was told to kill myself every single day. Every single day for the last five years that I was in school. And... It was coincidentally around that time that I started to question what my mom had taught me growing up, what the church had taught me. We went to the Nazarene church, and um, I'm grateful that I was raised in church because I don't know if I'd be here had mom not made me go. Um, it was about 2010 that all the bullying started leading me into a severe depression and it got bad there were there was a few occasions where I tried to take my own life where I, I listened to the bullies that was telling me to kill myself and end my own life and as you can see I was not successful and thank God that I wasn't so about 2011 rolls around and by this time, the bullying is at its worst. And as such, I'm starting to really question, if God is real, why is he allowing this? Why would a loving God allow such horrible things to happen to me every day in school? I now know the answer to that, but I'll get into that a little bit later on. So 2011, I started getting into heavy metal, and this is going to be a pretty large part of my testimony, is my music. The music that I listened to that got me into Satanism 
and the music that I created even after I got saved. So 2011, it's, it's ironic because the reason I started listening to metal was because my youth pastor told me not to. And so I started listening to the very bands that he told me not to listen to. And I started listening to the words, the words that I tried to justify within myself. And at the end of the day, if the songs, if the words, if the lyrics, if they are not of God, who are they of? There's only one other option. There's only one other option. If it doesn't glorify God, then it glorifies Satan. It took me a while to realize that even after my first experience with God. So I started listening to the words and I started embracing what they were saying. And to my knowledge, mom was unaware of what I was getting into. Of course, she, she probably could tell because she's, she picks up on every little detail as most moms do. But I was, I was starting to get really into the occult, really into uh, anything that was dark, anything that went against what the church was telling me. I just, I wanted to cling to anything but God. And that was whenever, that was w whenever I ended up finding God. I need to scratch that. Um, it was 2012. I had fully embraced the message that Satanism was giving. I, I became very selfish. I cared only about myself. I only cared about what made me happy. And I, t I completely turned away from the church. I was fully into studying the different satanic texts and whatnot. And that was what led me to where I felt like I could take my life and nothing would happen. Because see, th there's a common lie within Satanism, and I'm not going to dwell on that for too long because my testimony is to glorify God. But um, the common lie is that Satan doesn't exist, and yet they call themselves Satanists. So I realized that in 2012. I was at youth camp. This whole time that I was studying the occult and studying Satanism and embracing their message, mom was still making me go to church. And thank God for that. So it was June 10th, 2012. And I was at youth camp. And I, I was going through a lot of bullying at that time. And... It just so happened that one of the kids from my church was bullying me that day. It was a Tuesday morning, and I woke up to him bullying me, to him trying to uh, prank me as a way to wake me up. And so that set the snowball for that day. So as the day goes on, he still continues to just try to break me down. That's all that bullies try to do is just break you down. And I find myself in a position where I either have to go away from Satanism, from the occult, from everything I was studying, and therefore go away from being suicidal and depressed, or I could further embrace it and lose my life that day. So I thought I had made my decision whenever, um, whenever he, I can't remember exactly what he did, but there was something that he had said that set me off. So I actually was walking back to the cabin to, to commit suicide. And God sent someone who I, I hope can come to one of my testimonies, a man by the name of Nick Stroud. It seems like God sends a lot of people named Nick into my life. Um, but he was a counselor at this youth camp, and uh, God sent him my way to witness to me, to tell me that he didn't know exactly what I was going through, this guy. 
but he wanted to tell me that Jesus loved me. And this whole time that he's talking to me about God, I'm just kind of standing there like, all right, yeah, this is what I've heard before. This is what I've heard my entire life. But it stuck with me. Because at that point, God had not ever been personal. So whenever he said, Jesus loves you, it kind of, it rocked my world a little bit. So by the time he's done talking to me, about 20 minutes has passed, and at that time, we have to go to the, uh, to the dinner. And every, every student always had to be accounted for at youth camp. So we go to the dinner. I eat. And then as I'm about to go to the cabin after the dinner, someone else stops and talks to me until it's time for chapel. So I go to chapel, and... I'm just sitting there, it's like, okay, evidently I'm still sitting here for a reason. Because by my own plan, I would have already been gone. So, God was literally keeping me from being able to go back to the cabin. He sent every possible thing that would keep me away from the cabin. And I am so grateful. I'm grateful now that I can stand here and attest to the fact that whenever we want to go our own way, whenever we want to go down a road of destruction, God can and will send those roadblocks. And the only way we can get through is if we force ourselves through. And I found myself in an altar call. And it was a massive altar call. There was so many people that went up, both students and staff, because they they felt that calling from God that they needed to get right. They needed to give their hearts, their lives over to God and submit to God. And I'm not going to lie, I felt that too. But I the the last thing I wanted was God even at that moment. And so I found myself in a position where I knew If I didn't go up, I was going to die because that's what I wanted. So I was in a position where it was my will or God's. And so people went up for about 20 minutes, just a solid line going up to the altar. And finally, they stopped going up. And it's at that moment, I'm like, okay, God, a few minutes have passed. So if you send one more person up to the altar... I'll go up. Keep in mind, five minutes, at least five minutes between the last person and me. But the moment that I prayed, which that was the first time I'd prayed in a long time, the moment that I prayed and said to God, if you send one more, then I'll go up. I'll submit. The moment I said that, someone got up and went to the altar. Isn't it funny how God works like that? So I found myself broken and just everything that had gone on in my life was going before my eyes. And I realized that I had, I had to submit to God because without God, look at where I was. Without God, I was broken, beaten, and dead. And then God stepped in and saved my life. So once I submitted, once I prayed the prayer, which I'll get onto that in a, in a few minutes, once I prayed the prayer, everything was all peachy after that. Life went so good after I got saved. And... Lord, forgive me, because that was absolutely not true. Life did not get easier at all. It was after, after I had that first experience with God that things started to get a little bit more real. I realized that true salvation lied in complete surrender. And there, there was some stuff that I held on to. I'm not going to lie. And so 
from 2012 up until last year, even though I thought that I was right with God, and even though I felt like that I was genuine, there was still parts of me that I was holding on to that I had to let go of. So there was a lot of battles that went on, and my mother and I, we ended up experiencing homelessness on more than one occasion. Uh, the first time that we experienced homelessness was back, what was it, 2016? And at that point, I was starting to realize that I, I needed to totally surrender to God. But I still didn't exactly know how to do that because um, the church that we were going to didn't ever really explain. You know, they, they, they were big on the prayer, but not after the steps that you had to take, how to remain and how to truly submit to God. It's God's will, not mine. His ways are higher than my ways. And whenever we were homeless, there, there was days that I was praising God because I knew that we were going to get blessed. And there was days that I was crying out to God, why are you letting this happen? I'm trying my best, but see, that that's the issue that I ran to, into is I was trying. And ultimately, it's nothing I can do. It's what God can do. But I was still, I was still leaning a little bit on my own power. So I decided whenever we were homeless that I was going to just praise God anyway. And so for a time I did. And that was actually a very powerful time in our lives. Um, we were staying at a hotel and I actually got to witness to a lot of the employees there. Um, they, were all, uh, they were all Sikh, which is a Middle Eastern religion. And uh, I got to witness to them. And I was honestly terrified because whenever you're witnessing to someone who already has a different religion, that can be very terrifying. And um, the owner specifically, like you could tell that he was pretty hardcore about his beliefs, but God kept leading me back to witness to him. And after youth camp of that year, he led me to pray with this man. And I was supposed to pray with him that God would show himself real. And so I did, and I don't know if anything ever became of that. We haven't been there since then. God ended up blessing us with a way out of homelessness, and um, then after that, we, uh, we actually met my buddy Nick over here. I, him coming tonight is just such a blessing to me because he can attest to the fact of where I was back from 2017 up until early, early last year, maybe late 2018. See, I, because of the fact that I never was fully rooted, and by that I mean I hadn't fully submitted as I should have, um, I started to backslide. And I never went back into the stuff that I was into because once you come out of that, you never want to go back. But I started to backslide and... Um, there, there was a lot that I went through back then. I, uh, I had my first big heartbreak in my life. Um, I had a ton of quarrels with the church, and um, I ended up leaving the church altogether, and God still wouldn't give up on me. This whole time, God was working on me and trying to make me realize that I had to completely give myself up to him. I had to. I was still trying to go by my own power. By this time, I had already been in music for a couple of years. And um, I started out as a Christian metal artist. I started out with the right intent. But the right intent isn't always God's intent. And so I realized early on, whenever I was 
starting metal. I realized that I wasn't going to be there forever. I realized that God was going to call me out, that God was going to have me go into worship music. And God sent many people my way to tell me about that. God sent Nick to tell me about that. <laughs> and I didn't want to listen because I wasn't fully submitted. And so therefore, I wasn't fully open to the idea of God bring, bringing me out of what I wanted to do. So last year rolls around. And we're in a position once again where we're losing our home. And it was entirely my fault because I didn't have a good work ethic up until I have my job now. I didn't have a good work ethic and so I couldn't hold down a job. And we ended up losing our home in Franklin. And that's whenever we knew, okay, God's going to bring us somewhere else. God's going to plant us somewhere where perhaps we were always intended to be. And I find myself here in Connersville. And by this time, I, I still believed in God, but I fell away. I didn't, I didn't turn away from the belief of God, but I turned away from God. And people like Nick and other friends had seen that happen, and they were trying to talk to me and tell me, hey, man, you need to get right with God. And I wouldn't listen. The moral of this story is whenever God is speaking to you, rather it's through dreams, rather it's through other people coming to give you a message from God, listen, don't do what I did. I tapped that mic again. Don't do what I did. Actually listen. Because whenever God speaks, it is a direct word for what we're supposed to do, for where we're supposed to go. So we moved up here, and I didn't know what to do up here. I, I was a city boy. I, uh, it was a culture shock. And I, was, I knew that God was working on something big. And in my heart, I knew that God was going to find a way to break through to me again. And that's exactly what happened. We were at a food bank, and um, there was a lady who started ministering to us about her church. And so mom is all into the idea of going to a church here. But me, I'm sitting back kind of in my own little bubble I'm like, there's no way I'm going back to a church. And then God happened. So mom wanted to try the church out, and she made me go along with her. And keep in mind, I was a Nazarene boy. The whole idea of jumping up and down and falling out in the spirit was blasphemy in the Nazarene church. And I'm realizing that now I'm... <laughs> I'm glad that God set this up how he did. So we go to this church, and it's a Pentecostal church. And keep in mind, I was, I was a Nazarene boy growing up. So I sit down, and the next thing I know, the pastor is jumping up and down on the platform and yelling and running down the aisles, and then everyone else is running down the aisles, and it's like, this is just chaotic. I kind of like it. And um, what God did was he put me somewhere that I could relate to because I was in a spot that if I couldn't relate, I didn't care. And it was within two services, man. It was within two services that God was like, look, you either get right, you either submit to me and only me, or it's over. Because I was starting to get far into my own will. I was talking to Sony Music. I, you know, I had so much that I was going for on my own that I didn't even pray about. But God 
wanted me to make him the center of everything I do. And that's exactly what happened. I realized that of my own accord, I was nothing. I, <laughs> I can do nothing on my own. God has, to, God has to be the one leading. And so I, find, I, I found myself last December completely giving myself over to God. I finally, I was at a place where I was on my knees. I had nowhere else to go. So I said, God, I'm yours. And I had, I had that moment with God where I was on my knees. I was weeping. It, I'm not a crier typically, but I was weeping just straight up like, you see me crying, you know something's happened, but this time it wasn't something bad happening. It was God. Amen. It was God happening. And I'll never forget just that moment one-on-one -on -one with God. I didn't know what was happening around me because my eyes were solely on him. And actually, uh, the service that that happened at was a service where at our church um, we had... Um, we had a couple of different bands. It was uh, Chosen Grace and uh, who was it? It was Chosen Grace and uh, someone else. <laughs> um, Uplifters. Uplifters, yeah. Yeah, that was who it was. And uh, I was at the altar and I was, I was already weeping and one of the band members had gotten blessed and started running the aisles. And so they run up. I'm right here. They run around. Bam, right into me. And I go out, man. <laughs> it was such a powerful moment. And that's whenever I had my moment with God where it's like, I'm yours. I don't know. I, I was like, God, I don't know what in the world just happened, but I know I've never felt this in my entire life. I want more of this. I want more of you. I want to give myself over to you because if I don't, then I'm nothing. There was things that I had done and gotten into in my life that I can attest to that Bible verse where Jesus says, none are good, not one but the Father. And once I realized all of that, once I realized the fact that I had to submit. My life had been a constant slope. Right here is 2012 where I had my first encounter with God. Everything evened out a little bit, some rocky places, downhill until last year. Whenever I fully submitted. And then even though there was bumps, even though there was some painful things that happened, God brought me to a place where I have such a peace and such an overwhelming, I don't even know how to describe it, truly. An overwhelming sense of the love that God has for us. That's why whenever I see someone on the street, that's why I always want to just love on everyone that I come in contact with. Because I never know but what whoever I come across is going through something that I've been through. Rather it was abuse, rather it was something happening at the babysitters, which I don't want to get a whole lot into that. Rather it was Satanism. God can reach anyone. God can reach you. You can be broken, lying on the ground. You can be high on dope. You can be drunk. And God can look at you and say, I have called you. I have chosen you. So take my hand, get right with me, and let's walk. 
That's what God did for me. Now, I, I never really got into drugs. Um, I almost got into alcohol, but God took that away very quickly. Thank God, because I, I have an addictive personality, so if I like something, I go for it. So I'm glad that God took that taste away. But if I can tell people one thing about God, it's that God is a loving God. God is a holy God. Life may not be easy. In fact, it's not going to be easy, and it sure won't be easier after you're a Christian. There's so much going on around the world today that Christians could justifiably be terrified going outside their house in some countries. There are some countries where it's illegal to be a Christian. So life as a Christian is not going to be easy. But God will give us the grace. God is a loving God. He is a holy God. He is a merciful God. God is rich in mercy. And if we turn to him and have that sincere moment one-on-one -on -one with God, laying everything that we've done, laying all our sins on the line, sincerely repenting, putting our full faith and trust in him, Look at what he brought me out of. He can bring you out of wherever you're at. And if you're at a stagnant place, if you are a recent born-again Christian and you're just stagnant, he can pull you out of that too. God can take any situation and use it for his glory. God can take any situation and turn it around for the good. What the enemy meant for evil, God can turn around and use for good. So the stuff I went through, the abuse, the, the bullying, the suicidal thoughts and ideation, I can now go and witness to people about those specific things. Say, look, I was there. I was there. But God but God brought me through. And that's true no matter where you're at. God can bring you through. God can bring you through. So that brings me to the final part of my testimony. I have no idea how long I've been doing this, but um, that brings me to the final part of my testimony regarding music. So whenever I fully submitted to God, and it's like your will, not mine. God, your ways are higher than my ways. So what do I do about music? I was starting to get a lot of popularity in metal. I was one of the best guitarists in Indiana. One of the vocalists, I was decent. <laughs> um, but once I submitted to God, it just didn't feel right. Metal no longer felt right. So I found myself in a place where it's like, okay, I want to give this over to you, but I don't know how because this is all I've known in music. This is the only kind of music I've ever made. And so I wrote my first worship song, which um, I completely rewrote time and time again. And it's funny because the first version of that song, I, I hadn't even played acoustic guitar, but I picked up an acoustic guitar and I learned three chords, three whole chords. And so it's funny because I had just written this lyric and I was trying to figure it out with the chords that I learned. And it was at that time, like I was, I was so on fire and actually I told Pastor Mike, I said, man, I just wrote this, uh, this worship song. I'm excited about it. And he's like, all right, that's cool. That's cool. He encouraged me and all that. And then it was, I can't remember what day it was, um, but we were here uh, during a, I think it was a worship service. Was it the tent revival? No, it was before that. Anyway, um, so I had just told Pastor Mike about this song that I was writing, and at that point, I thought it was good. And unbeknownst to me, he was planning on bringing me up to play it for everyone. And let's just say it didn't go so good. 
the mics didn't want to work with it, and I didn't know what in the world I was doing with my voice. So it ended up going a little something like this. The words were, who I am, who am I, which is actually a line that I'd written back in like 2013. But it was after those first lines that it was like, yeah, I need to just stop playing and wait until God actually leads this song. But it went a little something like this. It's like, who I am. That was one note. Who am I? So that was a song that I had written whenever whenever I knew I was going to go into worship music, but I still was writing out of my own flesh. I was still writing out of my own perspective. And that's why that song turned out so terribly. <laughs> so I ended up submitting my music to God too. And then it was like the floodgates opened. I was writing lyrics unlike anything I'd ever written before, man. I was writing such deep lyrics that were 100% inspired by God. God gave me a song called The Death Cure. And whenever he gave me that lyric, it was like, well, God, that kind of sounds like it could be a metal song. Are you sure you want me to go out of metal? It's like, no, this is where I'm calling you to. I'm not calling you back. And so for the second time ever in front of people, mom's favorite song that I've ever written, so it has to be good. The death cure goes a little something like this. A little out of tune. We're going to go with it anyway. So what does the death cure mean? You see, whenever Jesus died on the cross, he eliminated the need for us to die and go to hell. Jesus thus is the death cure. So that we don't have to face the second death, which is hell. So that we don't have to take the punishment. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's why we die. So what happened whenever Jesus died on the cross? 
was he paid the fine. You see, whenever you're in court, if you, have a, if you have a traffic ticket, someone can pay your fine and the judge can let you go. And that would be legal and just. So that's what happened in God's court whenever Jesus died on the cross. You see, we've all sinned. We've all sinned. Everyone's lied. And if you haven't, then amen. <laughs> um, most of us have probably stolen something. Rather it, was, uh, rather, it was something as small as a pencil or... I don't know if we've got any bank heist people in here, <laughs> amen, but um, you could go through the Ten Commandments, and we've all failed pretty miserably. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So whenever we die, and whenever we stand before God, how are we going to fare? If God uses the Ten Commandments, are we going to be innocent or guilty? I can't speak for anyone else but myself, but I can tell you I'll be guilty. But because I gave my heart to God, because I submitted to God and had a sincere repentance, and make no mistake, repentance must be sincere. Repentance mu must be heartfelt. Whenever I gave that heartfelt repentance and whenever I put my full faith and trust in God, I accepted the fact that Jesus paid my fine so that I don't have to. And that, that is the reality that we have to face as Christians. Make no mistake, God's got to accept us. But understand that in order to get to heaven, we have to fully submit. In order to get to heaven... We have to have that heartfelt repentance, and we have to put our full faith and trust in God. That is how we can have everlasting life. That is how. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever should believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In addition to that, I want to include a verse that me and Brother Nick have discussed quite a bit. Godly sorrow brings repentance not to be repented of. But worldly sorrow brings death. So my friends, consider this. Consider, have you given that? Have you given that heartfelt repentance? And that applies to anyone rather Rather, they're not saved yet, or rather, they have been saved in their eyes. Because, see, I thought I was saved back in 2012. And perhaps to the extent of my knowledge, I was. But compared to what I know now about God, about salvation, about repentance, I can't say that I was saved in 2012. And that, that, has <laughs> that hit me like a ton of bricks the other night, actually. So everyone here, everyone on Facebook, everyone who's going to watch the replay video, understand that God loves you and understand that submission to God isn't a bad thing. I thought for a while that it was because I, I thought that I knew best for my own life. That's not true. God's ways are higher than our ways. God bless everyone. Um, at this point, I open the floor to any questions anyone may have. Nothing's off topic, so I'm a pretty open book. Um, God bless you all. God bless everyone on Facebook. And seek God in everything you do. Absolutely everything. If anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Or elaborations, if I need to elaborate on anything. Uh, personally, I just want to thank you for coming. Um, like I said, I seen, I had, uh, had heard your testimony briefly over um, the Hope House meeting, mm -hmm. over Park Place, and um, friends with you on Facebook and everything, and just 
seen seen it grow and because I knew I knew Danny was talking about you know interested in that the metal music and stuff and and then and watching on Facebook you know going into the worship <laughs> going into the worship music and stuff and uh, yeah just seeing the growth it, it's been awesome man and I knew when we started the media up we were taking you know after people come to give testimony I had you on my mind you know the whole time and uh, just got the chance to, to peek into your Facebook and have you come and I thank you and I, I love how you, you just draw the whole story for every, every step of the way man and I like how you explain too you know how you know you went through those rough patches you know I made a post about that on Facebook today because a lot of times I think you know when we're going through those rough patches um, I think we tend to give the enemy way too much credit oh, yeah. to them rough spots you know it's the devil's trying to destroy you or something but I think God takes you through some of the or let, allows you to go through some of those rough patches of your life because he's conditioning you for the other side you know what yeah. I mean it's glory to glory you know what I mean he's, he's letting you go through that and, and our free will has a lot to do with that you know we take ourselves into places that we don't want to and uh, but you know he's always right there with his hand out man just to catch you back you know and come back on but um, I thank you man thank you I'm I'm glad and honored to be here um, any time that I have an opportunity to tell people about how good God is, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful you reached out, man. It's an honor to be here. And I'm glad everyone here could make it as well. Anybody else have any comments or uh, questions? Uh, yes, sir. I just want to thank you for coming, man. Uh, your time spent here spent with greatness. I can relate to it from over 15 years being a fractured pagan. Mm -hmm. and uh, being a reborn Christian it was nothing but faith man yeah and uh, I can relate to a lot of your story I was uh, went through quite a bit of abuse as a child and everything ever spent most of my childhood locked up just so I could get away from mom mm -hmm. so uh, I just want to thank you for coming out and being able to share that I really appreciate it a lot and I can't speak for everyone but we've already got some thanks we got a round of applause man it was, it was a great testimony and Thank you. I, I appreciate that very much. It, it's always fascinating whenever I can give my testimony, and I never know who's going to be in the crowd. Like, I've uh, I've had people in the crowd who were former Satanists, or in your case, like you said, former paganism. And it, it's always fascinating to fellowship with other people who have come out of similar backgrounds. And so I appreciate you telling me that sincerely, and I'm glad that brought that God brought you out as well. God deserves all the glory. It's it's nothing we can do, and uh, only God can bring us out, especially whenever you're in something that deep, Satanism, uh, paganism, witchcraft, you name it, God's the only way out of that, and uh, so sincerely, thank you very much for those kind words. I, I appreciate that sincerely. No. <laughs> some, some of you guys uh, may have seen that thread um, on the poster about tonight, uh, which is Paul and um, a guy who, who said he was a Satanist. Yeah. And he was, one of the things that I admire about not back down. I mean, his, his belief is strong, and he will not back down from it. Um, and he can explain step by step why he feels. And you know, in the Bible, it does say um, in season and out of season, he 
is ready, is prepared to give so that we can mind and flow the way we do in Paul never backs down from it. And I'm a proud mama. And it was, you know, yes, I took him to church and, you know, I, I tried to bring him up to know who God was uh, from, you know, the time before he was born. And um, it has a, it, it, it has had a hard um, road to walk, but to see where Paul is today, I am, I am proud. You know, evangelism don't get me wrong, I, I have absolutely nothing against the people who want to go and, you know, shout. I have nothing against that. I believe that that can be absolutely God-ordained. But evangelism isn't always about getting up in someone's face and shouting. Sometimes evangelism can be as much as, yeah. hey, brother, yeah. Yeah. witnessing to you just like this, talking to you on a personal level, yeah. not putting yourself above who you're talking to. I've seen that so much where people want to put themselves above as their superior. None of us are good. It's like I said earlier, none are good, not one, but the Father. So who am I to go and act like I'm superior? It's God. 